What's going on, Internet? It's Andy Gutierrez from Inside Lucasfilm Headquarters, and I'm just going to cut to the chase. This week, we're going to talk about how Obi-Wan finally killed Maul. That's right, Maul's dead, which technically would be a spoiler. But if you're watching a Rebels recap show before you watch the episode, then you have bigger fish to fry than leaving an angry comment. You did this to yourself. Maul's dead. This is Rebels Recon. <laughs> Believing that Obi-Wan Kenobi is still alive, Ezra sneaks off to Tatooine to investigate, where Maul is also lying in wait. I must draw Kenobi out, tempt his noble heart. But during a trying moment in the desert, Obi-Wan reveals himself and steps in to help Ezra. The truth is often what we make of it. You heard what you wanted to hear. However, when Maul discovers Obi-Wan's whereabouts, the two engage in a final duel. Twin Sons finally brought closure to Maul's long and twisted story. I sat down with cast and crew to talk about the process of bringing back and then killing off this character, recreating Tatooine for Rebels, and Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan. Watch. It's been over 15 years since Maul and Kenobi met for the first time in The Phantom Menace. What's it like finally ending that story? Going into this, I know we had a really rigorous conversation around the idea of whether or not it's something we should be doing. And especially knowing the journeys of both those characters, really making sure that that moment was being constructed from a place of what the story demanded, not from a place of something that we all personally wanted to see. We were the crazy people that brought him back to life and I didn't want it to happen in any other form. I thought that we had a responsibility to try to find a way to end it. I also always felt that like in a way by bringing him back to life, it kind of robbed Obi-Wan Kenobi of this victory in this moment in his life. So I thought it's a way to bring that back. How many iterations of this episode did you go through before <laughs> getting to the final stage? Several, several. Interesting thing about the early drafts, I included Kanan on Ezra's trip to Tatooine. However, as the story developed, we realized that really this was Ezra's. Ezra kind of brought the rebels in contact with Maul, so it made sense that on some level he would have matured and basically take on the responsibility of dealing with Maul himself. There were a lot of deleted scenes from that episode. Tons and tons, probably more deleted scenes than have ever been done. You're just constantly taking things out, less is more, and see how much the audience really needs to understand what's going on. Do they have enough? You have to be clear, but I had to cut it for time, so much of it. When you're working with some of those legacy characters that are so fundamental to the Star Wars universe, it's important not to lose sight of the characters that are within our show. So it became really critical to understand what this episode meant for Ezra. And when we started development on season three, it became very clear that there would be an opportunity to tell this story and that in fact, perhaps in some way, Maul finding Obi-Wan could be Ezra's fault. And I remember very clearly when we started talking about that idea, and you always know because the best ideas are terrifying and exciting at the same time. You know, when you have that moment, which doesn't happen often, where you think, oh my God, this is either genius or disaster, is when you know it's actually something you should be pursuing. This is the first time that we've seen Tatooine in Rebels. Were there any particular locations that you felt you wanted to make into this scene? There were some initial discussions about whether or not we would go to Mos Eisley or someplace a little bit more settled. But as you start plotting out the story and you realize what the central point is and who the characters are that are going to collect you realize you didn't need all that business. We really wanted to show the desolation and how empty it is and how no one would want to live here. So it's actually a pretty great place to hide just because it's so vast and stark. We really just wanted to make it feel reminiscent of what you would see in A New Hope. The opening teaser of the episode, the whole effort of that is to show you that even though Maul knows what planet Obi-Wan's on, it's very hard to find a person on a planet. So I wanted all these long shots to dedicate time to the feeling of hopelessness that he has. This is the first time that we've seen the Alec Guinness version of mm -hmm. Obi-Wan in animation. Yep. What are some of the key elements you needed to get that character just right? We really went back to A New Hope. You know, he's got a little thing with his mouth that he does and the way sort of his eyes kind of crinkle just a little bit. So we tried to sort of get those kind of qualities in it and really pay attention to sort of the idiosyncrasies that he has when he was acting in New Hope and tried to sort of get those in along with him being just little bit younger, not much. If you've watched the behind the scenes for Revenge of the Sith, Ewan McGregor's face, when overlaid on top of Alec Guinness's, lines up incredibly well. Their mm -hmm. features are actually sort of mapped 
in a very similar way. They actually have enough similarity in their faces that it's not a difficult thing to translate. So it was one of those things where because the foundations were all there and because in real life those two actors are remarkably similar facially, it was a pretty sort of seamless thing to go from one to the other and it was more about details of the costume and the hair than anything else. I worked a long time with James Earl Taylor as Obi-Wan and he's fantastic as Obi-Wan Kenobi and I like his Obi-Wan very much. So for me it was interesting to have him as young Obi-Wan in the hologram at the beginning of this episode and then still be able to portray the Alec Guinness Obi-Wan using Stephen Stanton. You know, Stephen happened to say to me in a recording, he's like, you know, I do really good Alec Guinness. And I'm like, really? Okay, let's hear it. And it was just, everyone was pretty shocked. We've seen you portray a spot on Peter Cushing, and now you're taking on an iconic voice of Alec Guinness. What's the process like for nailing that sort of performance? You do a lot of study of the original actor's performance because what you really want to do is pay homage to the person that originated the character. They're the ones that came up with that. There's that very sort of fatherly delivery that he has, being the mentor. I think what he does with Luke Skywalker, you can see him treating Ezra the same way in this story. And so you want to study what they did and try to bring as much honesty into the performance as you can because what you're trying to do is serve the narrative, serve the story. And when you do that right and the two come together, then it works. How do you think Obi-Wan was spending most of his time in the desert? Tatooine is a dangerous place and there's things that a Jedi could do. But at the same time, Kenobi's in a very different place in his life. Obi-Wan is very likely doing a lot of meditating mm -hmm. on the Force and probably deepening himself and he's learning those techniques that Qui-Gon was exploring. Being out there is a journey for him in its own right. It's like a rite of passage and it's like he's got to stand the heat of the desert and the cold of the night and he has to learn that and I think that's why he ages so significantly. All the cares that he's had, all the people he's seen die, I think that that's all very difficult for him. Alakinus has a very specific fighting style in A New Hope. What's the process for animating something so iconic? We actually took a little bit of what Ewan did and what Alec did, which was kind of cool because like we didn't have what Ewan did obviously first so to be able to take like that classic pose that Ewan puts him in where he's like at the saber here and we never got to see Alec do that but we were able to actually sort of make that happen which I thought was really cool. Weirdly the lightsaber probably took as long to get right as Obi-Wan himself. The lightsaber was actually from scratch so we did start with the Clone Wars version of Obi-Wan's lightsaber but it wasn't as simple as just painted so it looks old. We had to sort of tweak the proportions and, and sort of get it closer to the movies. The actual duel between the two masters is very short, like a samurai film. How did you come to the conclusion that it had to be done this way? We never entered into this story trying to think about how satisfying that battle should be. It really became about what was the genuine intention of this moment and knowing where these two men are at this point in their lives. I think it's important for us, even though on the timeline we aren't to A New Hope yet, to think about what we know of Obi-Wan in that movie and to work backwards in some way to make sure that the character's progression charts appropriately. When you've fought someone many times and are faced off, you kind of know each other's moves. So if you think about it, the buildup to this confrontation and the actual lightsabers hitting each other is actually longer because they're basically playing it out in their heads. And the amazing thing is the move that Maul tries after the initial exchange, he actually attempts the move that killed Qui-Gon Shen. He tries to basically bash him with the hilt. If you talk to a lot of people that sword fight, they'll tell you people that are very good don't have long fights. It's very quick. And so that scene, it's an homage to the Seven Samurai. I think on one level people would be excited to see another prolonged lightsaber fight, but I just never really saw the confrontation that way because to do that is to say the characters don't have growth. Yes, it's exciting as an audience member, but it's not a really believable thing. The storytelling has to evolve. Between the Clone Wars and Rebels, you spent a lot of time with Maul. Yes. What's it like finally coming to that moment that everybody's been anticipating? Well, I've been anticipating the moment for a long time. So I I knew that once we were doing Rebels, I was like, okay, there's no way he there's can no avoid yeah. his own death at this point. I'm so grateful that Lucasfilm to even have this opportunity. I mean, every time that you get a hold of one of these characters, it's kind of like a rental because it's Star Wars. These characters are bigger than the actors that are playing them. I think it's important that, you know, we're all stewards and we're sort of temporary stewards and we want to do something really cool and then leave it off somewhere where if in the future someone wants to tell another story, they have that to draw from. I don't think it's the end of the character in terms of people learning more about him. I think down the road we'll probably see more. But in terms of this story and probably my association with the character, this is it. And yeah, it's been a tremendous privilege.
Good night, sweet Sith. After last week's absence, I am 100% certain that I'm finally going to get to sit down with the Lucasfilm Story Group's Pablo Hidalgo to ask him your ever so pressing Star Wars questions. I guarantee it. Let's go. Wow, thanks for the super secret Star Wars info, Pablo. No problem, eh? Hey, Pablo. You hey, are not Pablo. Uh, yes, I am definitely the Lucasfilm Story Group's Pablo Hidalgo. Hey. Uh, all right, so I guess we're doing this bit again. Our question comes from AJ Aguila this week. He says, this has been egging away at my mind. Would the protectors have been loyal to Duchess Satine during her reign? So yeah, they would have actually been loyal to Satine. You actually see them kind of wearing their ceremonial garb, holding staves in Voyage of Temptation in the Clone Wars. And it's probably a safe assumption that they would wear something similar to the Mandalorian police outfits also seen in the Clone Wars. The outfit that Fen Rao wears is actually more the traditional combat armor of the protectors. Well, well, that was enlightening. Thanks, Pablo. Enjoy your coffee. No problem, Andy. Mmm. Tastes Canadian. It's like the real Pablo Hidalgo's on vacation or something. But if you have questions about Twin Suns or anything else about Rebels you want answered, tweet it to at Star Wars using the hashtag Rebels Recon and we'll answer what we can online. But now it's time for an exclusive peek at the season finale, Zero Hour. Enjoy. We've just received a new transmission from Fulcrum. This is Fulcrum with an urgent message. Thrawn knows about... Thrawn knows? Knows about what? About the attack on Lothal? Something's happened. Most of the Imperial fleet left the system. What does it mean? Thrawn knows we're here. All ships, battle stations! How can you be certain? The last time this happened, the Empire ambushed us on Garel. Commander Sato! We have Imperial Star Destroyers incoming. Thanks for watching Rebels Recon. We'll be back next week with our season finale. But if you need more Rebels info, check out the episode guide for Twin Sons on StarWars.com this Monday. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week. But not you, because you're dead.